Are we ready? So good morning. Uh, my name is, uh, for those who, who don't know me, my name is Luis Santiago Cabana, one of the cornea and refractive surgery fellows here at the Moran Eye Center. I have two uh, kind of quick presentations today. The number one is uh, basically uh, the LASIK enhancement, the PRK on flap versus flap lift, and the other one is an interesting uh, case presentation that I just recently saw at Dr. Morgipar's uh, clinic. So if you have any questions, you can stop me and I will kindly answer the question for you. So LASIK is uh, the most common corneal refractive surgery that is performed today. Uh, it has some advantages over surface ablation, AKA PRK or LASIK, EK LASIK, including uh, quicker visual rehabilitation, minimal post-operative discomfort, and the ability to correct higher or, uh, degrees of myopia with, without the complication of corneal haze that is seen in PRK and surface ablation. For every uh, refractive surgeon, uh, LASIK enhancement is a reality. It has been reported to be as high as 5.5% to 27.5% 20, in uh, uh, reported series. And some of the risk factors for uh, enhancement after LASIK include high preparative myopia, a high uh, uh, hyperopia or a hyperopia of more than one diopter uh, preoperatively, and astigmatism of more than one diopter uh, preoperatively. Age, it's been reported that uh, patients uh, above 45 or 50 years old, uh, they are at increased risk for uh, undercorrection or overcorrection depending on the, on the aggressiveness of the, sur uh, of the surgeon. Uh, and sex and room temperature and humidity has been reported, but it, those two are, those three are basically controversial. Other factors that are associated with the enhancement rate uh, include the surgeon nomogram. Uh, uh, the different surgeon nomograms may affect the rate of enhancement that is seen on the different series on the literature. The criteria of every uh, surgeon also affects the the enhancement uh, rate, it all depends on how high or low the threshold for enhancement is for each and every uh, sur a refractive surgeon. And laser technology has improved significantly the past 15 years, 20 years, uh, away from technology and the use of larger ablations have decreased the rate of enhancements compared to uh, the beginning of laser correction surgery in the in late 90s. Refractive uh, regression is uh, one of the main indications for LASIK enhancement. It's basically the regression of the treatment applied to the patient. There are uh, different theories behind the myopic regression, including epithelial hyperplasia, nuclear, nuclear sclero sclerosis, making the patient more nearsighted, changing corneal biomechanics, corneal stiffening, uh, increasing axial length and stromal remodeling. Again, these are theories behind the pathophysiology of myopic uh, regression. So basically, uh, when we when we have a patient that is that needs an enhancement, uh, there are two uh, popular surgical approaches uh, performed by surgical uh, by refractive surgeon. Number one is lifting the flap, the previous uh, LASIK flap, and the other one is performing a surface ablation or PRK on the flap, but which one is better? We're gonna review uh, the advantages and disadvantages of each technique, and then we're gonna, I'm gonna give you my, uh, our suggestion of uh, how to proceed with, uh, uh, with the case of LASIK enhancement. So PRK on, fla on the flap has some advantages. Uh, number one is an easy surgical technique. The, surg the surgical technique is basically the same as, a, as, a, as in a PRK, uh, as a primary PRK. The only thing that you need to be cautious is basically uh, avoid any trauma to the LASIK flap that the patient already had. Uh, it works better for patients with thin corneas. Uh, as you may know, PRK, uh, remove or ablate or remove less tissue compared to LASIK, uh, de uh, decreased risk of ectasia compared to LASIK. It is better for patients with post-LASIK dry eyes, uh, 
uh, and it's be also better for patients with previous flap complications. And it has been reported that the PRK can actually reduce uh, flap related higher or order aberrations and microstriae. And obviously, since we're not lifting the flap or making any new flap, we avoid any flap complications. The disadvantages of PRK on the flap include, uh, and this is the more worrisome haze, it's been uh, reported to be uh, more common or more likely to develop haze after uh, PRK on a, flat, on a previous patient with uh, LASIK compared to primary PRK. There's one uh, old report, uh, basically the first one reporting the, the rate of haze in patients on, uh, on with PRK enhancement over LASIK flap that actually recommends to not perform PRK uh, enhancement of patient with LASIK. But that uh, old report basically, uh, they didn't use any mitomycin C, which is an agent that we actually use to decrease the rate of uh, haze in PRK patients. Actually, mitomycin, uh, the, the haze actually, uh, it's caused by activated uh, keratocytes in the cornea, and the mitomycin basically uh, controls the, that activation. Uh, and also, in order to prevent the haze after uh, PRK, uh, we need to use prolonged use of steroids, of topical steroids, and the complications that are, are related to them are well known, including the possibility of intraocular pressure spikes. Another thing, uh, compli may, uh, another complication that may happen, uh, uh, especially with poor surgical technique, is basically an <coughs> inadvertent uh, flap lift or dislocation, so that's something that, need, uh, that you know, every surgeon needs to be cautious about. And the post-operative pain and post-operative uh, visual acuity fluctuation, which are seen uh, also in primary PRKs. So these are two uh, pictures of post-PRK haze. You can see the, the opacity on the visual axis in, in the top in the top picture here, and in here too. Another picture of more significant uh, haze in a post-PRK patient. You can see here too the haze in the visual axis, and this is a more dramatic uh, photo of a patient with a PRK haze. Uh, sometimes if the, if the PRK doesn't improve after prolonged use of steroids, uh, and after giving enough time for the, for the eye to heal, uh, superficial keratectomy or even PTK is needed uh, to improve this patient's visual acuity. So what about flap lift? The advantages of flap lift on LASIK enhancement include an accurate and predictable uh, outcome. Uh, the, the enhancement or ablation is gonna be done in the same plane as the primary uh, LASIK treatment, which in theory uh, will decrease any uh, higher or order aberrations and uh, it causes minimal discomfort and a, a quicker visual rehabilitation. But what about the disadvantages of flap lift? Number one, it's a more difficult uh, procedure to perform. Uh, uh, it can be difficult to lift the flap, especially on flaps performed with femtosecond uh, laser technology and the more time that, uh, the more far away are we from the primary LASIK procedure, the more difficult the, lift of the lifting of the, flow, the, of the flap is. And this difficulty with the flap lift can, ca can cause an epithelial disruption that may end up with one of the worrisome or the main complication after uh, flap lift in patients with uh, LASIK enhancement, which is the epithelial ingrowth, which is basically the growing on of epithelial cells in the interface of LASIK of the uh, lacy flag and the corneal stroma, it has been shown to be as high as 32% in, uh, in different series. So this is mainly the reason why some of the people who have practice surgeries do not perform uh, uh, flap lift on LASIK enhancement. Also, post-LASIK dry eye is another uh, possible uh, condition that may be ex exacerbated by uh, a flap lift enhancement. Flap complications, including diffuse lamellar keratitis, infectious keratitis, folds in the flap that may cause irregular astigmatism, displacement of the flap, flap edge necrosis, 
and a condition uh, or a symptom that is called interstitial fluid syndrome, which is basically accumulation of, flu of fluid in the interface uh, between the corneal stroma and the LASIK flap, mainly caused by uh, increase in intraocular pressure secondary to a steroid response. And there's always a possibility of, uh, of developing post-LASIK apatia uh, in patients after flap lift enhancement. So these are a couple of uh, pictures from complications for flap lifting in patients with LASIK enhancement. The number one is, uh, and the, the upper two are basically post-LASIK dry eye. You can see the epitheliopathy that, that is seen on the LASIK flap here and this here with the uh, uh, fluorescent staining. Over here is a DLK, grade two DLK. You can see basically the, some inflammatory cells uh, in the reticular pattern on the visual axis. Uh, the central toxic keratopathy is a condition that, uh, that has been described. It's basically an opacification, a dense opacification uh, of the flap leaf, uh, of the LASIK flap and corneal stroma seen in patients after LASIK uh, enhancement or LASIK, uh, primary LASIK, which basically uh, starts as a DLK, but then progresses to a more uh, dense opacification of the cornea causing hyperopic shift. Has been, uh, the cause of it is, un, is unknown. Uh, in the beginning, it was, uh, it was uh, the theory was that inflammation caused this kind of uh, presentation, but actually uh, it has been suggested that the inflammation has no role in patients with central toxic keratopathy, and actually it uh, heals by itself, improves by itself without any intervention. So uh, these patients usually you need to uh, see them more closely for uh, basically to uh, follow up on the improvement of it. Another uh, cases of uh, flap complications include flap edge necrosis, you can see here, uh, the border, the edge of the flap here, necro uh, the necrosis of the flap here at the edge, and the interstitial fluid syndrome, you can see here that there is a little bit of liquid uh, accumulated in between the LASIK flap and the corneal stroma. And again, this is secondary to an increase in trochlear pressure, uh, usually secondary to uh, steroid response. Epithelial ingrowth, again, this is the most, the most worrisome uh, uh, complication after LASIK enhancement with flap lift. You can see here some uh, epithelial nests underneath in basically in the interface in between the LASIK flap and the corneal stroma, and this is a more advanced case of epithelial ingrowth. You can see some nests here inferiorly and paracentrally here too. This is a higher magnification of uh, epithelial ingrowth. You can see clearly here, here uh, the epithelial uh, nests underneath the flap. More dramatic. Uh, photo of epithelial ingrowth at the top two, and this is basically how the patient looks after we perform uh, removal of epithelial ingrowth for visually significant uh, epithelial ingrowth after LASIK enhancement. I have a little uh, clip of how the surgery for epithelial ingrowth, visually significant uh, epithelial ingrowth is performed. This is a case demonstrating the treatment of multiple epithelial ingrowth status post LASIK. So LASIK we first basically uh, mark the flap edge of the previous LASIK carefully with a Sinsky hook. Uh, we basically delineate and start lifting the flap. flap for 360 degrees. I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't know what I thought. <laughs> Probably. I, ju I was just trying to increase the, the volume. <laughs> now it's back. So this is the, where is the volume? That's the first one? Yeah, so if you want it up to there. Okay. So 
This is a little break. That's a good question. Do you? Yeah, but here it's going to be careful that he just won't go through that. Like I, our algorithm is in like a kind of wing on to have this calculated after 18 months. And I started back to say, showing that the longer you get away from the initial Thank surgery, you. the rate of uh, epithelial growth can increase. So the fact that his epithelial tissue has been in epithelial embryos on enhanced. Out of how many? Thank you. So let's continue with the clip. So again, we delineate the flap uh, edge with a Sinsky hook, and then we leave uh, the oh. flap using toothless forceps. Using wax so we can scrape the stromal side of the, the flap uh, to remove the epithelial cells there. And we do also the same thing on the any stromal bed. The posterior aspect of the flap. The same process is used to remove you can see how the, from the stromal bed. epithelium is removed from the from the stroma there. Then after that, we can use a beaver blade to try to, to remove all the epithelial cells on the stroma of the cornea and carefully on the uh, stroma of the flap. A beaver blade is then used in a similar fashion, again attempting to remove all epithelium. Same thing can be done on the flap. Again, be very ca cautious and, and delicately because we don't want to rip that flap off. Very moist Maricel sponge is then used. 
and then we reposition the flap back in place. The stromal bed. The stromal bed is then hydrated, and the flap is carefully put back into position and smoothed down with hydration. A very moist Marisol sponge. So with this uh, sponge, we basically uh, decrease the chances of developing any striae or micro or micro striae on the flap. The Maricel sponge and is after also removing the epithelium at the edge of both the uh, the flap and the hole and the cornea, we basically put some stitches in there the to decrease the chance of developing a recurrent so epithelial ingrowth. One thing that we sutures. that you will see in a second is basically that we don't bury we don't bury the knots. Uh, uh, to basically decrease the chance also of developing recurring epithelial ingrowth. And after that, we put a bandage contouring on, on it to basically decrease the, number one, the pain or the discomfort from the knots. And second, to, again, avoid uh, developing any recurring Drops epithelial ingrowth. Zymar and Predforte are placed on the surface of the eye. Ten on island. And after a soft contact lens is placed, the case is concluded. Uh, a, a couple of weeks after the, the procedure. You can see here the knots are still there. Have and you then seen the, the uh, <coughs> procedures in these irregular stigmatism or they're not long enough for another structure? They are usually not long enough there. <coughs> I notice they're all on one side. Doesn't that run the risk of being a slip, uh, being a slide to the flat upside down? So these are also another uh, possible complications. Uh, this is basically seen uh, in almost all LASIK uh, cases, microstria, you can see the stria here. These are not visually significant, but the, if they are uh, big enough, they can cause irregular astigmatism. So again, after seeing all the pros and cons of both the, of the procedures, we suggest that in a patient, depending on the criteria of surgery, uh, of the surgeon and LASIK enhancement. If the surgery, if the primary LASIK surgery was performed uh, less than one to two years, uh, the decision can be made whether or not to go with PRK on the flap or flap lift based on the rate of complications that can happen after each of the procedures. But definitely uh, in patients over two years, we strongly recommend to perform a PRK on the flap uh, mainly uh, because of the high chance or rate of developing uh, epithelial ingrowth uh, after LASIK, uh, LASIK flap lift for enhancement. So this is the end of the first present, uh, presentation. Anybody has a comment, question, doubt? Okay, so these are my references. Now we're going to uh, continue with the case presentation, the man with the bilateral corneal edema. 
This is a case of a 76-year-old male patient with a history of hypertension and Parkinson's disease who comes, who was seen at the, for follow-up at Mo Dr. Moshifar's uh, clinic for a uh, left corneal scar. The uh, patient has a history of a previous episode of corn left central coronary ulcer uh, that healed and uh, resulting in scar and thinning in the visual axis on the left eye. But the thing is that the patient during that uh, visit prefer uh, a decrease, a chronic decrease in vision in both eyes. So his past medical history, the patient has a history of Parkinson's disease, hypertension. He uses a global medication, uh, aspirin, carbidopa, levodopa for his Parkinson, amantadine, and a couple of medications for uh, uh, depression and psych psychiatric uh, illnesses. And he has a surgical history of bilateral faker musification and intraocular lens. On the slip lung examination on the 17th of January, uh, the patient was found to be, uh, to have a best corrected visual acuity of count fingers on the right eye and hand motions on the left eye. It is worth uh, to mention that the right eye on the previous episode, on the previous visit, about two to three months before the presentation on the 17th, was 2030 corrected. The left eye has been on the count fingers hand motion uh, range mainly because of the central uh, corneal thinning and corneal scar. So basically his eye went, especially his right eye went from uh, 20, 30 to count fingers. Uh, the pressure of the eyes are both normal. A patient uh, has evidence uh, of neighboring gland disease on the lids. Sclera and conjunctiva quiet. Uh, the cornea on both eyes uh, showed uh, three plus decimal falls with uh, one plus stromal edema. And there was no evidence of gutata or any sign of inflammation or infection on both eyes. The left eye, although the central cornea uh, was thin and scarred, there was evidence of uh, decimal falls too without evidence of gutata. The interior chamber was quiet on both eyes uh, and the rest of the examination was normal. The patient uh, uh, has uh, Park Parkinson's disease, so it was a little bit difficult for us to uh, take a picture of the patient. This is not a picture of the, of the same patient. Uh, the patient is, uh, ha is on a wheelchair. So uh, this is a representative uh, illustration of the patient's right eye. You can see basically the decimate folds on the cornea and the increased stromal uh, edema. So when we, when we talk about corneal edema, we need to know that the corneal endothelium maintains the corneal clarity through mainly two functions. Basically, number one, it acts as a barrier for the aqueous to come into the cornea. And number two, it provides a metabolic pump uh, to maintain uh, the corneal hydration in about 70%. And increased permeability and insufficient pump sites occur with, uh, when we have endothelial cell count uh, of less than 500 cells per millimeter square. The pathophysiology of acute corneal edema, uh, it's basically uh, secondary to an altered barrier effect of the endothelium or the epithelium. In chronic corneal edema, we see more of an inadequate uh, endothelial pump. The causes of a corneal edema include for acute cases, trauma, inflammation, hypoxia, uh, especially uh, seen uh, as, as it may be seen on patients with uh, anterior ischemic syndrome after multiple uh, muscle surgery, a high drop from a rupture of decimate, increasing trochlear pressure. Uh, on the chronic side, trauma can cause uh, chronic corneal edema along with toxins. Uh, dystrophies can also cause chronic corneal edema, edema as is seen in Fuchs, uh, posterior polymorphous dystrophy, and eye syndrome. Uh, post cataract surgery, retained less fragment can also present with uh, chronic corneal edema, hypotony also can uh, present with chronic corneal edema. So basically we have a patient with a subacute chronic bilateral corneal edema secondary to endothelial dysfunction. We, don't, we didn't see or we didn't find any uh, gutata on the patient. There is no history of trauma. It's a bilateral condition. There are no signs of uh, inflammation. Uh, could this be a secondary to a toxin? Could this be a secondary to any medication? Does anybody have a possible explanation for this patient presentation? I got an answer. You got it. Sorry. What's that? I think that I still, so still, 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 still have another possibility. 
Mm -hmm. That's true. But only corneal attendants can see that. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, amantadine has been shown to cause uh, an endothelial toxicity resulting in corneal edema. This is the first uh, uh, report that we have on amantadine. Uh, it was done by Dr. Blanchard from Oregon. It basically uh, described a patient uh, as a female patient, 64 years old, developing uh, acute uh, corneal edema following uh, amantadine use. And in this case, it was uh, completely re reversible after uh, cessation of the medication. Same thing here, uh, Dr. Jiang uh, described cases of amantadine induced uh, corneal edema or corneal endothelial dysfunction found uh, that actually uh, after cessation of the medication due to prolonged chronic uh, corneal edema, it wasn't uh, possible uh, for the cornea to uh, get clear and they, some of the cases needed corneal transplantation and other uh, case report of patient with corneal endothelial dysfunction following amantadine toxicity that actually resolved completely with, amant uh, with amantadine cessation. And what happened to our patient, basically on the 17th, we sent a letter to the neurologist to consider stopping amantadine. And the patient was started on Pred Forte and Neuro four times a day. Uh, two weeks after the initial evaluation, the neurologist discontinued amantadine about a week before the, the visit. The vision was still count fingers on both eyes uh, with, without any resolution or improvement in the corneal edema. A possibility of decimal stripping automatic endothelial, endothelial keratoplasty was discussed with the patient and the patient's wife. Uh, and we continue on PRET 40 and Amira, and we decided to see the patient again in about a month. A month in after the presentation, the best corrective visual acuity of the right eye, which is the, which is the best, uh, his best eye was 2040, basically back to normal. normal. The left eye uh, continued with count finger fi uh, vision mainly uh, secondary to the corneal thinning and scar from the initial corneal ulcer. The corneal edema resolved completely on the right eye. And we decided to, uh, to do a tapering of the pret port uh, and basically put the patient on mirror once. So <clears throat> after basically the take, up take, take home message about this uh, presentation, this patient is basically if we see a patient developing bilateral corneal edema on a chronic side, uh, nothing on the, uh, on the uh, slit line examination shows into inflammation or any corneal dystrophy. Uh, we need to check and the rev uh, review the medication list because sometimes we can see or we can find medication that can actually cause endothelial toxicity. Even in children, uh, there are a couple of reports of children developing corneal endothelial toxicity, again, secondary to amantadine use. So it is very, very important for every patient that presents with bilateral corneal edema uh, to basically review the medication. Any question, doubt, concern? Yeah, is there, is there any evidence that the topical steroid and, uh, and Miro has anything to the natural course of the amantadine? There's, there's uh, some reports basically that there's, there may be an inflammatory uh, uh, component behind the development of corneal edema secondary to amantadine. Uh, we don't know the exactly cause of how the mechanism of amantadine induced corneal and, and the filial dysfunction happens, uh, but there are reports of you know, improvement, slight improvement after, uh, especially Pret Forte with patient with amantadine uh, corneal edema, but the... But the natural course of the improvement off of the mentadine is through the cessation. Yeah, this is after cessation of the mentadine, the natural course is to improve depending on how chronic the corneal edema is and if, the, if, the, if there's dev development of scarring of the corneal stroma. Any other question? Thank you. Thank you.